The word politics seems to be on the minds of mehni gahnawage rono these days. Education, justice, membership, and an array of political issues seem to be being discussed. On this episode of Our Town, we're going to bring you up to date on some of these issues, mainly education and how Canadian legislation is affecting us here in Gahnawage. So right now, we're going to head over to the Mohawk Council of Gahnawage and speak with Portfolio Chief on Education, Robert Patton, and see where the Mohawk Council of Gahnawage stands on this issue. Let's go. So Bobby, currently you are one of the portfolio chiefs on the education uh, issue. Um, tell me what has developed in the past couple of weeks regarding education and where are we right now? Well, we were trying to work to a possible vote that was going to occur to call the, um, the vote null and void, mm -hmm. but there were supposed to be discussions and such to bring us to that. But it seems like the council called it as a null and void due to our legal opinion. But, you know, we're trying to work with the combined and try to work with the community and try to make everybody happy. You know, you take that high road type of thing. Mm -hmm. But it seems like every time we come to an agreement of some sort in principle that it's it's gonna things are gonna work but when you make agreements and a discussion that needs to take place after it seems like everything falls apart mm -hmm. and some the actions went uh, above and beyond us and it was like a premature some some moves that were made mm -hmm. which completely sidetracked us again mm -hmm. you know and that seems that's what's been happening now we're at the point where the vote is, is going to still be considered null and void. What? It's not one of the rounds at an impasse right now. What mm -hmm. next step to do? Right. You know, and it's like it's very difficult because we always got to keep in mind whatever we're moving towards or what we're working at is a goal that's going to be beneficial to our children. Mm -hmm. You know, and the parents, yes, they all got to be informed of of. Uh, the decisions and they're the decision makers really and that's what we want but with the two bodies that can't seem to come together on mm -hmm. anything really when we do then it gets separated again mm -hmm. and know? just to like um, clarify when you talk about the vote that's null and void you're talking about the annual general assembly vote that had taken place that's back correct. in September at the end of November. September November November, November and then from there there was a whole bunch of issues with the election and just bringing people up to speed and then the holidays came in that's correct and then on January 10th was the first time that Mohawk Council had met again with, with the combined the combined school committee which is the media was present myself in the eastern door and uh, Yuri was a um, from that meeting, there was another meeting that was held with the parents on a Monday night, which was about two weeks ago. That's correct. And there were several agreements that were made in terms of um, having another vote to the parents in terms of a question. Do you think the elections will stand or not? That's correct. Now, during this council meeting, it was agreed to, provided that there was two weeks notice and that some information went out to the community. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward now to the meeting that had happened. There were some parents that didn't want that meeting, that that vote to take place. No, because they want the <laughs> MCK removed from all education. Which was another motion that was put that on was the floor. That was motion that was yeah. put on the floor. And apparently they wanted to have it that evening. Mm -hmm. But since the media brought it forward and held them accountable, mm -hmm to the, the meeting that took place with the MCK that no decisions would be made mm -hmm. that evening. It was just supposed to be an information. Which it was, and then I believe that even though the parents wanted them not to do this, they did issue a press release now saying, okay, on the 28th of January, we are going to ask the question, will the election stand or not? Now, according to Mohawk Council, you guys haven't changed your position. No, we It's didn't. still null and void. It's still null and void. But they're still going to have this question That's presented to the parents. Correct. So now where do we go from here? Because now there's been several press releases from 
the combined and the Mohawk Council, mm -hmm. and there's been a several meetings over the last couple of days. What's going on now? Well, right now, it's like we still stand that it's still in void, mm -hmm. okay? We were going to work to that meeting that was going to take place on the 28th, but we were supposed to have meetings, like to have some discussion how or, you know, what what ways are we going to get there and how mm -hmm. are we going to inform the parents? You know, parents have to be in, um, notified about the legal opinion that MCK, you know, received. received. Okay. And we were hoping the combined would show their legal opinion why they said it was still a valid type of election. Election, okay. But unfortunately, they can't... Uh, they can't present us with a, um, a legal opinion. Mm -hmm. But we're willing to show our legal opinion. Right. Which, you know, and that's going to show the parents that we're transparent. Mm -hmm. And here it is, you know, there it is. Read it. This is the reasons. Now, in the press release that Mohawk Council issued following the Combined School Committee where they had said that they were going to hold this vote on the 28th, mm -hmm. um, they also said that there was an agreement between the Mohawk Council and the Combined School Committee that the same regulations would apply. Now, clearly, the Mohawk Council reissued their statement saying mm -hmm. there was no agreement made no, and we don't support that. The meeting that was present was the only meeting that took place with the media that was there on, I think it was the Monday, uh, Thursday. Mm -hmm. It Thursday was Thursday, prior, yeah. yeah. And during that meeting, it was a discussion that started to take place about moving towards the 28th, but at no point in that discussion that the council agreed to have the same rules that would follow the same AGA. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why we don't want to follow that same rules is because there's so many inaccuracies that came from it. I think it would be very inappropriate to give that back to the parents. And just just hearing that is out there, the parents, mm -hmm. we got many calls and concerns, they're not going to follow that. Then here we go, we move a little fast forward to the meeting on the Monday of the, the 10th of January. Now with, uh, because people talk in this the town, 14th. and again, yeah. it was like a firestorm after the meeting. Yeah. And we got flooded with calls. One was their concerns about the vote. Why do we have the MCK removed from education? Mm -hmm. That can happen. Teachers are concerned. Now it goes, they want to know what the effects if MCK was removed from education. A lot of teachers and a lot of parents who are teachers now have like uh, say their pensions and all that. You know, how will that affect it? How is it going to affect us? Mm -hmm. You know, with MCK being removed, you can't do that. You know, and that's a concern for many parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from some of the issues with the MCD and the work plan, which is what was discussed at that January 10th mm -hmm. meeting um, and now you know clearly there's issues with this vote taking place on the 28th and now which regulations will be applied um, where does everybody go from here because the combined mm -hmm. school committee is saying well we're still going forward trying to get the constitutional uh -huh. constitutional review underway we want that too you know you know, we want the constitutional review. Mm -hmm. Now there's a discussion about uh, independent investigation. Mm -hmm. That's what we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. There's got to be, that's, there's questions that need to be asked before it moves forward. And I hope the combined will um, uh, work with us on that, mm -hmm. you know. And there's other issues that need to be addressed at that, that review. Mm -hmm. But it, we're, the combined is out of it, we're out of it, it's going to be an independent. Now, okay. going back to the elections, we don't want to have the same same uh, grounds that we went before because, it's like I said, it's, it's not going to be good for anybody. Mm -hmm. People don't want to be put in the same type of venue that occurred the last time right. and have it like just two hours. They don't feel confident and pretty much like they're, they're intimidated. Mm hmm you know, how do you bring people to something like that before? You know, our recommendations and our thoughts mm -hmm. were to move forward. Yes, if we're going to do something like that, let's get an independent body that's going to do it. Secondly, let's have it, uh, say, maybe a Saturday from 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. But we were supposed to have that type of discussion to move forward. 
you know, and they, right. but we were supposed to have that discussion to move forward, you know, on those issues. What happened was that parents wanted to get us voted out. Then they asked to request to meet with Grand Chief Mike DeLille, right. but he was on vacation. We said, yes, we'll meet with Grand Chief DeLille and the table because mm -hmm. they don't think the table has the whole say. They believe that Grand Chief has the, the, the final, final say, say. Mm -hmm. but it's the table that has the say along with Chief Mike DeLille, mm -hmm. you know. But we were supposed to have that meeting. They canceled on it. They yes. canceled that meeting. They said, no, we're not going to have another meeting. Mm -hmm. We're moving forward to this election. Mm -hmm. If well, anything, they'll meet, they'll meet after. after the election. Now, is that showing consensus, like uh, working together, It's or it's just, you mm -hmm. know? We don't have any uh, securities for the parents or to say that this is what it's going to, you know? And they feel it's... It's being sidelined again. They're yeah, and you know what? Um, there is this majority of parents that does exist. Mm -hmm. There was a, a parent that had spoke at the meeting or, or also one of the, somebody who had spoke at the meeting and, and referred to that silent majority. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it is consistent. You know, I know as a journalist, I've talked to many parents who do not go to those meetings. And I did question the combined school committee about the behavior um, in those meetings can get very, um, very heated, you know, and, and I've witnessed that. Um, it's not surprising that some parents at this point have just given up or they don't want to be put in that mm -hmm. kind of predicament. And I think it is the, the responsibility of the combined school committee to maintain that control mm -hmm. and integrity of the meeting. And they obviously agree and feel that they already do that. However, mm -hmm. there is that majority also that will say, well, no, that's not what's going on. So who represents them? It should mm -hmm. be the combined school committee, right? It, it should shouldn't be. be this division. But they, they don't have faith in the combined because you look at their supporters that are with them. They're very loud. They're very rude. And they don't take people's uh, into consideration. It's their voice, nobody else's voice. And the people that are quiet and that stand by, idly by, are mocked or called down, you know? And it's not fair, you know? Mm -hmm. Then who else do they have to turn to? But they turn to the MCK because we're their voice. We always said we're their voice. And that's where they, they, they feel that their voice will be heard, you know? And yes, it, we're, we're trying to make sure their voice is being heard. Mm -hmm. And we're taking the brunt of the name calling and the rudeness and uh, you know the belittling in public mm -hmm. but that's our job you know but i think the combined school committee over and this is you know prior to you being elected to the mohawk council you know they had taken a lot of bashing too last year and emotional yeah. abuse i mean it got very heated in some of those meetings too and it was like mm -hmm. the tables were turned there was a larger majority but of parents who were really going but that's, at them that's the whole part about it it feels like being the separation between MCK and combined, they're getting the bashing, we're getting the bashing. Well, everybody yet, at this point is just getting yeah. bashed at some, you know, you know it doesn't seem like I, things are progressing. I have friends and family on the combined, and mm -hmm. you know what, whether they like me or not, I still feel that they have this job to do, and it's unfortunate. All these things that have come to this date have almost divided us completely. You well, know, I think the divisions are clear. Yeah, it's clear now. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate, one side or the other side, you know, whether they go back to their supporters and they, they don't like MCK and MCK is the bad guy and everything and mm -hmm. don't listen to them. If everybody would stop and just say, look, let's bring it together and let's work it together and come to a compromise or somehow bring it and let everybody be happy. Do you but see that happening? No, but it's a wish that I, you know, I could put under my Christmas tree and hope for. Where do you, <laughs> you know? Where do you think things will go from here? What is the Moa Council's position now in terms of this vote taking place on the twenty eighth? Where do you guys? Go well, from right here? now, for the vote that's going to take place on the twenty eighth, we're not going to recognize it. We're not going to recognize it. The vote is still going to be held null and void. But there's guys. We got to move forward with trying to solve this issue mm -hmm. because. You know, 
the reason why we're saying this is because the parents are not going to show up for this election, not the election, for this vote, you know, and it's going to be one-sided and it's going to still occur, you know, no matter so if So what do you suggest? What I suggest is, well, I, I take it from one point of one parent, she came up to me and, you know, she says, and she was a supporter of MCK, but she's also fed up and saying, why don't you guys step back? Why didn't they step back? You know, put somebody that can you can hire and put in place, and work work on the what do you the, um, constitution. the constitution, work with the independent investigators, put the people that need to be in place, and move on to maybe this, the following school year when everything settles down, and let people get to work. You guys can concentrate on the business that needs to be handled, and you know everybody just. I said, that would be a great idea. Maybe we can propose it, but will the combined school step down and walk away and let this person come in and, you know, deal what with the issues? What about putting it back into the hands of the community at a community meeting? That's what another discussion that we're having. Let's go to the community. You know, it's been said from the start of this region, right from when I first started on this issue, you know, let's give it to the community. It's a community issue now. Mm -hmm. really is. It's not just about well, the parents. everyone's become involved at this Everybody's point. involved. Mm -hmm. You know, like we got people coming up to us and it's like, when are you going to end this? Let's move on. Mm -hmm. And people don't even have kids in school. Yeah, I know. I hear it too you know, as a journalist. And, so. and for me, I think that would be the best way is to, you know, give it to the community. Let them decide what you want to do. You know, let's make these questions up and, mm -hmm. you know, let them decide okay. and put it to rest and move on. So I guess we're going to see what happens on the 28th, even though clearly you just stated that Mohawk Council will not recognize any kind of vote that's going to the It's not just the MCK parents. saying that we're not recognize it. This is also the voice of the people mm -hmm. because the people don't want it recognized because they don't feel even if they were to go, things would not be done right or, you know, in their perspective, it would be like almost a one-sided because they keep saying it's always, uh, you know, packed with their people and their supporters. Well, it works on the other side is get your supporters to come and do this. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's just about the intimidation factor now. Aside from all of these issues with the General Assembly, the annual General Assembly, the vote and things like that, what are the other, because people are trying to move on and you do see some, um, you know, some of the issues that were in the MCD have been met, you know, Louis John's back in place, you have Robin mm -hmm. Dallarone who has been appointed as your interim director of education, the constitutional review is moving forward. Aside from all the politicking, what would you say are some of the major issues in education? Well, that's what we discussed this morning. We have about um, the level of education has to be increased throughout Ganawage mm -hmm. because we, we have to try to bring our own children back, you know, back into our education system. Mm -hmm. You know, with all the C3 and all the issues about um, the monies, the the, um, the funding mm -hmm. is going to get cut down. Not because it's not getting cut down because of uh, the government's going to cut it down. The reason is because of all the other people that are being called into our system now. The money's going to be spread a lot thinner. And what happens is the parents outside that were upset that they don't get the amount that they used to for their children to be going to school. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to take into account our teachers, you know, there's more education that needs to be given also to our teachers maybe, you know, to upgrade our level of teaching and our education. Mm -hmm. There's issues like that that need to be addressed, not just the uh, HR issues. Right. It goes further into it. Well, some you people know? would say that that should be left up to the committee or the administration and not the Mohawk Council. That's what we're, we don't want to deal with it. Right. That's been our start and from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We don't want to deal with it, but those are what needs to be dealt with. 
And that's what's not being dealt with right now, you know? Maybe because of this whole squabble that's been going on, mm -hmm. you know, and that's unfortunate. But, uh, you know, the educators, Robin, they're, Robin's doing an outstanding job. Mm -hmm. You know, I think with her being in there, things have got back on streamlined and she's, she's, she's the main person that's brought this all together. You know, some people would say, you know, looking on the outside in, is that at this point it seems like it's become a power struggle between the Mohawk Council and the Combined School Committee and all these personalities, you know, are mm -hmm. involved now and the real essence of the issue has gotten lost in who's going to win. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, that's what keeps bringing, you know, it's, it, is a, it seems like it's a power struggle. But you got to remember, like, we don't want... We don't want to be involved in education, and we keep stressing that. Mm -hmm. We'd rather be away from education, let everything be handled by the educators and uh, the board, whatever it may be, without without us being involved, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sad because we don't want the power, you know? And the thing is, why we're in this position is because the concerned parents come to us. They want our voice to be our voice to be given to them, but, you know, and that's mm -hmm. where the, that's why MCK is involved so deeply. So right now, we're still at a standstill, basically, and we're we're trying to look at what next step forward. We got to, and it has to be these steps have to be moved forward quicker because we got to bring some type of resolve to this issue, okay. take it away from the limelight evermore, and let let the schools start running and everybody and you know that's my concern all right well thank you and good luck with everything yeah. and i wish you all some peace and resolve so. in this matter I mean, for me personally it's like that's what i want is for us to all start working together and come put all our our heads together and come to a good ending to this that's all i want okay well thank you all right So that was an update from the Mohawk Council and we're here filming at their offices. We're also filming in a deep freeze. Everybody knows how absolutely cold it is out here this week. So I didn't even take my jacket off once I got into Bobby's office. Um, but moving on, um, we have been in talks with the Kahnawake Combined School Committee. And of course, over the last several weeks, there's been meetings held between the Mohawk Council and the Combined. There's also been several meetings uh, that were held with the parents. A lot of issues still going on here, as you heard from the Mohawk Council. Now, on the side of the Combined School Committee, they have made several statements. Unfortunately, nobody was available for an interview, but I did happen to take some notes made from the chairperson of the Combined School Committee, Tina McCumber Stacy. Um, she says the committee has received a continual uh, direction from the parents to move on from this issue now. The issue that seems to be holding up this whole po process is politics, whether it be personal or not. Um, she says, the combined school committee feels that we have met all the points in the MCED 32 with the exception of the constitutional and independent reviews which are going to take place. For example, the interim director is in place until June 30th, which now is Robin Dallarone. We will be posting for that job in March, and Director of Finance Louis John Daibo is back and fulfilling his normal duties in finance and the day-to-day -day operations are stabilized. Meantime, in an effort to try and move forward from this disagreement between the Mohawk Council and the Combined School Committee over the validity Surrounding the November Annual General Assembly elections, the Co Combined School Committee has agreed to hold a vote on January 28th, asking if the vote for the four general seats still stands. The vote was announced on January 14th, giving the two-week notice, which was requested by the MCK. We will be using the same process and procedures from the AGA in order to be fair to all those who voted and to ensure that we do not make up procedures out of thin air. These procedures were jointly agreed to by the KCSC and the MCK prior to the November 7th vote. 
says McCumber Stacy. The meeting and the vote will be scheduled to be held at Garoni Nuha School on Monday, January 28th, um, between the hours of 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Parents will be asked, bear with me, it's very cold out here, do parents consider the November 7th, 2012 reaffirmation and election results valid? Yes or no, parents of school-aged children in Gahnawage school system, nursery to Egypt, will be eligible to vote, and that's the update. Now, uh, earlier on in the show, we mentioned there's other political issues happening in Gahnawage, specifically the Idle No More movement and legislation, Canadian legislation that affects us. We're going back inside to talk to Christine Diom Zachary, Mohawk Council Chief, to get some clarity on some of these issues and where does Gahnawage stand in all of this? Come back in, it's cold out here. So Christine, um, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about some of the how issues about surrounding the Idle No More movement Teresa, Chief Teresa Spence, I know a lot of this is political and mm -hmm. in opposition to the first bill that had come out, which is the Omnibus Bill C-45, which has now been passed into law. A lot of people maybe don't understand how this affects First Nations or perhaps how does it transcend down to Gahnawage. So I was hoping that maybe you could shed some light on how does it affect, what is the effects of this bill? All right, first of all, C-45 was legislation that was brought in to Royal Assent December 15th, although if you look online, you'll see it says December 14th, mm -hmm. but that was just the invitation, and I think it was one of the times that the Governor General actually attended at the Senate to, have, to sign it into, to give it Royal Assent. And so, how does it affect us, mm -hmm. and why is Idle No More as a movement focusing on Bill C-45? Mm -hmm. It's because it's it's omnibus legislation, so it hit out at a number of different areas of Canadian life. And uh, when I say omnibus, it's the kind of legislation where you sweep everything. You weren't able to pass in the last term of your government mm -hmm. because maybe you had a minority government. And so what they do is they put everything together and they put together little brief snippets from the Indian Act some change in notification on how uh, bylaws are going to be published. That was one of the ones that mm -hmm. went into C45. So there were a number of little, little details, amendments that would have gone on their own and tied up government for a, a little bit of time. So by putting it in, in omnibus legislation, they managed to get everything put through in one shot. Mm -hmm. And because they have a, the conservatives have a majority, then it's easy for them to put it into. Mm -hmm. into effect. All it needed was royal assent. Some people will say, well, the Governor General doesn't have much power and so he signs everything in and, you know, and that is true. And at first we didn't realize that he had already signed royal, given, sorry, given royal assent. And he did do that. So technically it's in force. But whether or not they act on some of those provisions is another thing. And I understood from when Lloyd, Chief Lloyd Phillips gave his review mm -hmm. of the, um, the meetings that were held in Ottawa in December that uh, one of the things the Prime Minister mentioned was that certain of this legislation would be revised or reinterpreted in implementation. What that means is, even though things are in force, laws are in force, mm -hmm. and given royal assent, that maybe the way they'll tackle it may change. So perhaps some of it will change. Now, Ganawage wasn't averse to certain parts of that because we've always been compliant with our accounting procedures. Mm -hmm. We've always had grade A as far as the way we take account of monies, programs, services, everything, the way we deal with monies here. So it wasn't something that we would really complain about because we already go by general accounting principles and we're always very good at managing Ganawage money. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something specific. But when the Grand Chief wrote a letter to the National Post, I think it was, mm -hmm. he focused on the issue that the government itself is liable to ensure that monies that are given to a council have people who can actually administer, have the capacity to administer monies. Right. Now, people in Ganawage, I don't think 
No, not many people know what it's like to be in northern communities. Northern communities can have people that aren't literate, and yet they're still operating. They still know how much gas and oil and diesel needs to come into their community, mm -hmm. and they may pay for things just like that, just in cash or right. a check, and, and they don't take a receipt, and they just know they paid 90000 out for their, for their uh, supply of diesel. So here in Ganawaga, if we're going to pay that amount out, let me tell you, we have a receipt, yep. we have a bill, a, and, a you know, an invoice, a budget, <laughs> and uh, it's, yeah. it's signed by two chiefs of council, and they pay the bill. Mm -hmm. And then the accountant will look it over and make sure everything is done properly. Well, some of these things were pretty <coughs> controversial, in not just in the way that monies flow into the communities and how things are reported back, but there was a whole slew of issues to deal with land and the way that law was. Yes, that's being another. Passed, that's and another felt portion. Like they weren't um, being consulted. It was that's just right. like, here we go. Yes, and that's right. And I think uh, Mulcair, uh, the leader of the NDP wrote specifically on the lack of consultation and the hurried up nature of this. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you look at governments and you look at their majorities and you look at the minorities, you see there that it takes a combination of Liberal, liberal Party and NDP in order to stop things happening. Mm -hmm. But already a lot of those items that were put into the omnibus had already gone through various passages. Mm -hmm. Now the one, um, I, was, I was just going through the issues on Bill C-45. Right. The other thing of course is the one that you mentioned and that's leases. A lot of First Nation communities <coughs> have been complaining that in order to raise funds, uh, economic development revenue for their communities, mm -hmm. they want to lease lands and they want to lease it to some big factory and they're going to employ a lot of the First Nations community members to work there, but they cannot do it uh, with good time, in good time. And so a lot of corporations will go off to other places because it's easier to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that complaint was made is because in order to lease lands you had to have surrender issues dealt with and that meant you had to have half your population agreeing. First of all they had to show up and half that number had to agree plus one had to agree that, okay, let's lease our lands and we're going to lease it to this big rubber tire manufacturing mm -hmm. place and we'll all get jobs there. Great. <laughs> but it couldn't be done. So right. these companies would move off to other places. So on that issue, on the issue of surrenders, what they did, which is a little bit dangerous for other things, for leasing of land and you only have to post the notice and 30 people show up and 16 people vote in favor. So it passes and mm -hmm. a surrender is given. So that's a little bit iffy. So that was on the surrender and lands issue. Mm -hmm. The next thing was the rivers issue. And right. the rivers, the navigable waters. And in the C-45 you see the listing of all of the lakes and rivers and waterways. Mm -hmm. And certain of the protections that were on there that maybe slowed down economic development somewhat have been lifted out of the protections. So environment is really environmental protections on a lot of Canadian people's waterways, those waterways that they enjoy and they enjoy the protections as well. Right. You know, that's raised a lot of indignation, mm -hmm. ire and indignation, I'd have to say. And as far as the St. Lawrence River goes, for us, you know my position on that I think from before. I've right. always felt that no matter what Canada and Quebec does with the St. Lawrence River, how does it benefit us, really? Mm -hmm. They said we're uh, putting a treaty between Quebec and Ottawa, and in that treaty we're going to say that we want to promote access to citizens to their waterway. Well, you know, I, I've said it before, our waterway that we don't access because there's a seaway running right through our community, mm -hmm. and even our little onage, um, our little inlet there, we didn't get much water because they can shut it off. Yeah, the water up. levels have been Yeah, it's been terrible, the worst low. ever. Yep. And so what we got was a whole bunch of weeds and we've got problems that are a hangover from when they put the seaway through mm -hmm. and it blocks the flow of water into our community. So that's where we have some issues with water. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as some of the ways that the government pushed it through, it's not 
the best way to put through legislation. It may be the best way when you're in a majority government to do it, but they got a lot of reaction from the Liberals and mm -hmm. from the NDP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're looking at their legislation and we see how it affects us, I've also had the experience of seeing how our legislation affected them. Mm -hmm. They felt that they should have had a, a hand in drafting our legislation. Well, similarly, we should have a hand in drafting their legislation, especially if it's going to come back and bite us. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but we're going to react a certain way. Right, but when you think of the role of the AFN in Canada, and the consultation that didn't happen with them, I think this, you know, a lot of people question. I mean, Gatnawage, do we recognize AFN or AFNQL? It's very political. But the role of the AFN to work within those, you know, the realm of parliament, people wondered where they were at the, this point and why was there a failure of consultation through that <laughs> elected what? body? What we didn't like was the fact that AFN was given the role of consultation. Mm -hmm. That's not the way consultation works. Consultation means when you're planning something that's going to impact Ganawaga, then you better talk to the Mohawks of Ganawaga. Yeah. Because that's what the requirement is. You don't talk to AFN on that. And that's mm -hmm. been our position all the way through. And it was also the position in the 60s and in the 70s. The Iroquois Association of Iroquois and Allied Indians at the time said AFN does not speak for us. Back in 2003, we said the same thing. AFN does not speak for us when it comes to the issue of specific claims or treaties, mm -hmm. because our treaties are older than the numbered treaties, and our treaties go back to pre-Confederation. So you can't speak for us, and don't you dare say that our treaties don't have the, the weight of the numbered treaties, because certainly it's up to us to say what is the weight of our treaties and what did those treaties mean to us mm -hmm. and to the governments. We were pretty unique in that stance. In, in politically, there are a lot of communities who recognize AFN, and we're wondering, well, where was that mm -hmm. um, consultation? But recently, I recently, have to say, yeah. there is a, a protocol that they enacted to say that uh, AFN and the Iroquois Caucus is going to work together. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we give our voice over but certainly we'll have more of a say. Mm -hmm. I know that when I attended as a technician the treaty workshop that happened in Saskatchewan about three years ago, I, I was really adamant with respect to the position of the pre-Confederation treaties, our position, mm -hmm. and mostly all of the treaties that have been enacted pre-Confederation have to do with Ganawaga. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that the Algonquins, or the fact that the Hurons, or the fact that the uh, Atlantic provinces pick up on our treaties is amazing to me. Whether they picked up on the Treaty of Oswegatchie, the Treaty of Ganawaga, as it's called, 1761. You yeah. know, it's amazing to me. They can suddenly take ownership of it. Mm -hmm. They're not the Mohawks of Ganawaga. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Clearly. <laughs> yeah, and so that was, I was a little ticked off when I went to Saskatchewan and saw that they were just sort of brushing our, our rights just under a carpet while they were uh, negotiating or consulting with the people who are the numbered treaties, mm -hmm. the elders and treaties from the western provinces. And so for me, AFN always means the power of the western provinces. Mm -hmm. I don't find that we've got the kind of clout that we should have. And if the Iroquois caucus can get some aspect of clout, mm -hmm. if they can somehow deal with the AFN in a stronger position that'll enforce and support our position, well good. But certainly mm -hmm. we're not gonna we're not gonna be uh, our powers, our rights are not gonna be taken away from us. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that there was such a strong reaction to this this bill and that the Idle No More movement had started? It was uh, four women, you know, from from the Western Territories, actually, and it just seemed to take off from there. I don't know if you remember when um, the lawyer from the West Coast was here speaking in the winter time, uh, almost uh, a year Sharon? ago. Yeah, Sharon, Sharon Venn. Venn. Yeah. And when she came to speak, I didn't go to her talk, but I certainly watched it about six times till the family got fed up with <laughs> it always being on on. Uh, on the TV, but from that point on, there was the groundswell. That was beginning, that was a year ago. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And people were following this. And Pam Palmetter and other, other lawyers who were okay. concerned, had concerns. And then their networks as well concerning navigable waters were also very concerned. So I can see how that arose. And then the issues of Attawapiskat, that's been ongoing. Mm -hmm. It's been ongoing for 20 years. Right. And with Teresa Spence encountering certain things at meetings that she had attended, she spoke to you about those concerns that she had. Right. And her decision to do this, well, it just married the two things together perfectly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how Idle no, no More suddenly had someone that they could focus on someone who was directly affected by C45 with respect to financial management and mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it it uh, came out to be a perfect marriage in terms of uh, getting focus on Chief Spence and her situation and also on all of these concerns that had been raised over the past year and a half. Mm -hmm. As far as Attawapiskat goes and Chief Spence and the very fact of uh, northern communities Really, Indian Affairs had a big responsibility to build capacity before it's shipped over mm -hmm. millions of dollars here and there. My God, you send three women from Ganawage up to Attawapiskat, the people who have been so involved with financial management. If you ever sent Marcia DeLille or Marcy or Franklin Williams or, mm -hmm. or uh, Alana Goodleaf Rice, if you sent those people up there, my God, <laughs> things would be fixed pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But, you know, going up north, it's not, it's not the ideal place. If you're, let's say, uh, there was a doctor who did an article for the National Post, and he talked about his group of medical workers and what it takes and how people have to realize what northern conditions are like. And he said there was a man who had a serious, serious operation and his two daughters went to accompany him. It cost them $70,000 and they didn't have that money. And it was the council that picked it up. And how do they account for that? Mm -hmm. And how do they account for keeping their Donation. schools open? <laughs> You know, how do they account for that? Mm -hmm. How do they account for putting uh, diesel or whatever they operate, whatever they burn as fuel, into those schools or into their medical center? But they and must have their dogs some form of accounting in their band. I mean, they do have. Well, they pay for things, but they don't. <laughs> let's say there's no receipt. Mm -hmm. There's no receipt for, uh, let's I say, that know. medical I've thing. I wouldn't know. I've never been, and I don't know how other communities get managed and how they you know, fall into third party, but I know that here in Ganawage, you are expected to give every little detail yeah, of the budget, yeah. and then it's, you know, the whole community talks about it. Exactly. And, we bought a new bus. Or yeah. Like, you know, like everybody knows about it. But well, that's we not also how it get operates. Audited yeah, and, you know, and it doesn't so. happen that way up north. Mm -hmm. And this doctor's <clears throat> article was incredible, incredible that it was even printed. It was last week. You must get a look at it. Mm -hmm. And when he laid it all out, I thought, Regular Canadians would appreciate that because now they'll now see that the, the actual working and living conditions up north is so different from the regular Canadian I who just goes I over and imagine. picks up coffee at Tim Hortons and, and tools around and doesn't have to worry about extreme conditions mm -hmm. and, and also communities that don't have capacity to manage all of the monies that they have to manage mm -hmm. and sir in order to pay the services that are needed for their community. So in a way I wasn't that shocked when I saw that um, she was being questioned. She had already been in third party and gotten out of it. Mm -hmm. But then again it was raised. Yeah, you know? she did talk about it and she, she did talk about when she had taken over that these issues wouldn't be used against her, and they, they had made these agreements, and yes. she, she said that in the interview, and then they went and, and published, did it anyway. published yeah. it, yeah, and so it was really to uh, shock people. So what do you think is going to happen from here? I know that Lloyd had given um, a bit of an update. Um, obviously, this is, you know, a movement that's going to continue, but there are other bills that are passing you know, through Parliament now that are being looked at and definitely af affect us. There was, you know, there's talk uh, of... What we were talking about just earlier. Yeah, yeah. About S4, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Well, at and first it was C3. C3. That's right. It might be S4. I'm not sure. Three or four. Well, what they're saying about it is that eventually 
uh, every First Nation ought to have or should have its own law with respect to matrimonial property, uh, for division of property mm -hmm. on the, uh, when, a, when a marriage goes kaput, what's going to happen with the properties. Right. In a lot of situations, the man has control of the property and women, uh, let's say non-Indian women in this case, have raised this to a to an issue where their children have been thrown out of their homes and mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of sympathy for that and uh, this is not a new bill this no. has been discussed and for quite a few years actually when I, yes actually back in 2003 I drafted the letter that council signed when Joe Norton was still here I think it was around 2003 and that was that Ganawaga would draft its own legislation and mm -hmm. don't you dare tell us how we should draft it, we're going to draft it ourselves because it's our right. Our people will say what will be the situation on division of properties following um, the death of a marriage. Mm -hmm. So we followed, we decided that that's what we would do and that's what council signed off on. And yet it's taken forever for us to discuss this and also it's taken Ganawaga forever to get through a land code which is where it should go. Mm -hmm. So what the government is saying now when this passes it's going to have the right of force of law but if the council or if the community were to pass its own law on the separation of property rights, uh, separation of property interests after the breakdown of a marriage then if they were able to do that law, then that uh, First Nation law would supersede this um, particular oh. bill. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the yeah. thing is, they leave it to us. They're saying that, they're really saying that a lot of communities haven't drafted this law, mm -hmm. and yet we're not going to supersede them. We will until, or rather, we will until they draft their own law. Mm -hmm. So how long is it going to take us to draft a law on this? Right. I think it's got to be one of the priorities, and we've got to keep thinking mm -hmm. that it'll take about a year to do but for them so to many. put it into law. There's so many. Laws that come along, you and know? we can't yeah. do everything. Yeah. And every time we try to do something, we meet with a lot of opposition. So mm -hmm. the community has to realize that we're in this together. Legislation is for our own protection, mm -hmm. and we're protecting ourselves from outside law. And right now, federal law applies unless we can put in our own laws. Which is what we've been trying to, to do, do as a community. That's through right. The, the justice, the development of the justice system. Yes. And that's why you have CDMP and, but there's been opposition Consensus to that too. And there's been opposition to the making, way that it was yes. done. And so how do we have movement? Well, before it used to be readings in front of, you know, readings in front of the community, mm -hmm. make your comments, come to meetings, tell us what you want changed. And then eventually we'd have readings in, in the council, and then it got passed into law. To me, that was an easy way to go. But they said, or the community said, we've got to have more input. So we developed the consensus development and uh, um, that whole process. But I don't find there's much people attending. I, three people attend? Mm -hmm. That's not. And there's some pretty big laws a, going into the hall. Right, the, membership, the justice. Which is, you know, membership justice, is there, you know, and justice, and we're drafting. We're now starting right, the draft. Yeah. But let me tell you, I'm being very proactive on the drafting of that. I'm on the drafting of that particular legislation. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I want us to have something that's going to be good for us and not something that's going to come around and bite us. Mm -hmm. yeah, certainly, we've got to protect the community at, at all levels, at all levels it's and for all reasons. Not more. There's Participation? Not, yeah, for that yeah. one especially. I think for membership, I'm hoping there'll be. Uh, yeah, yeah. That one is, you know. It's crucial. Yeah. And so. for some people who are more open minded on membership, there has to be participation. Mm -hmm. And for me, I can't see us going into the future in an exclusive kind of style. Mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that we think ahead and realize that we've got to be careful that we don't end up just. Um, canceling ourselves out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, Thank well, you. thanks for your time. Thank you. It's so cold outside that we're, my camera guy and I are defrosting in the car right now. But anyways, 
that was an interview that you just watched with Christine Leon Zachary, of chief at the Moha Council of Gahnawage. Um, and here in Gahnawage, there's, you know, and nationally, there is a lot of legislation going on that natives across the country are reacting to. Um, as for Bill C-45, the omnibus bill that was passed by Stephen Harper, there's been a lot of discussion here locally in Gahnawage. I know the 207 Longhouse held uh, a meeting for the community uh, to discuss this bill and people were able to ask questions and what does it mean and there's been a lot of discussion via Facebook and social networks on um, how it's impacting natives across the country. So we hope that some of the information can shed some light on maybe some of the questions that you have. We just got into a little bit of how it affects us uh, today, but um, you know, there's legislation that's going on here locally too that is happening through the community decision making pro, uh, pro the community decision making process. Sorry. Um, you know, membership is coming up and it's something that the first hearings are set to begin. Justice is in its first draft. I think people should really, you know, take the opportunity to get involved uh, in this process and to discuss the legislation and how it's going to affect us here in Gahnawage and what is that going to look like. Membership going into the hopper is a huge deal here in Gahnawage considering that membership has always been a big issue. There's a lot of mixed feelings on membership and the opinions vary so wide. But here now, you know, in 2012, um, how does membership look in our community? Well, you have the choice to decide and you have the right to decide. And all you need to do is take part in this process. Whether you're going to do that or not is completely up to you. But of course, here at Moai TV, we're going to be looking at that and seeing what's happening. Anyways, um, here we are. It's the end of our program and thanks for staying with us. As always, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, don't be uh, afraid to give us a call at 450-632-6397 or you can uh, send us an email at mohawktv at hotmail.com. Now it's about lunchtime and uh, I'm going to head into Evelyn's store. As you know, Evelyn's will be closing in February. I believe it's on the 5th. And um, we're doing an interview with her today, but you're going to have to stay tuned for that interview. It's a wonderful story and it's, you know, obviously it's about a woman who started her convenience store in the heart of Gahnawage and it's been 30 years, but she's decide, she's decided to call it a day and we're going to go and find out why, but you're going to have to wait for that. But right now, I'm going to hop in out of the car and um, go grab myself a quick snack at Evelyn's store. And we will see you again. Thank you for staying tuned with us. And uh, we always enjoy all of our viewers' feedback. Niawa dana onigawahi. Kanyak ke haga thadi adrast ke yenga hiadu zewade roru.